Okay, I was uh, asked to uh, address the topic of ancestral diversity. So this will be a, a little bit of a, a change of pace from the last couple of talks. Uh, what I'll uh, be addressing this afternoon uh, is first a little bit of background uh, on human genetic variation. Essentially how we've been thinking about human genetic variation uh, over the last, well really several decades, uh, and, and uh, what, what the general patterns look like. Uh, and then I'll talk about how sequencing, just in the last couple of years, uh, has changed some of these views, and how in turn that uh, affects and pertains to some of the questions uh, that we've uh, been discussing uh, over the last uh, day. So one of the most basic questions we can ask is how, how is genetic variation distributed uh, among populations? And here we'll use uh, a convenient, not, not always the best uh, or most appropriate, but a convenient unit of subdivision, and that's the major continents. Um, and what we see is for a variety of different kinds of uh, genetic systems, uh, whether they're short tandem repeats, the old restriction site polymorphisms, mobile elements, uh, or uh, SNP data here, um, if we look at the apportionment of variation, most of it occurs between, pop between individuals uh, within these major populations, and only a relatively small proportion, typically 10 to 12%, uh, is due to differences between populations at that level. And that's uh, very consistent across different kinds of genetic systems. Now we can, to put that in perspective, compare that with, say, skin pigmentation, which varies a great deal among continents and is the re has been subjected to a lot of natural selection where the great majority of variation actually uh, is found uh, between con continental populations. Another way of looking at this uh, is for uh, SNPs from a, a 250K chip to ask what proportion of the uh, minor alleles are shared among populations, and we can see that the great majority typically are. Uh, and uh, the only continent that has very many population-specific SNPs, 7%, uh, is Africa. Now another way of looking at this variation is to uh, map it out on a tree that looks like this. Uh, and uh, of course these, these trees can be misleading uh, to some people because uh, they're sometimes interpreted as meaning that populations split and then had no subsequent contact. And of course, uh, as humans, we, uh, there's always been subsequent contact. But it's a convenient way of showing how uh, similar populations are to one another. And what we see is that populations do tend to group uh, according to their uh, geographic location. Uh, and that's really quite uh, consistent uh, across many different kinds of studies. And in fact, with a completely different data set, the Human Genome Diversity Project data set, uh, we see again the same pattern, both for SNPs uh, and uh, for a smaller number of copy number variants. And I can't resist pointing out that uh, this has been known for a while. Uh, this is a review published 20 years ago based on data generated uh, in the uh, 70s and 80s, uh, blood groups and protein polymorphisms. Uh, and it's interesting that with just 29 of those loci, you see very much the same pattern. So you really don't need that many loci to get the basic uh, pattern of uh, interpopulation genetic variation. But one thing that our high density SNP data allows us to do is to construct haplotypes, groups of closely linked polymorphisms, and to ask how haplotype diversity changes as we go from Africa to Central Asia, to Europe, to Polynesia, and to the Americas. And you can see that there's a substantial reduction of haplotype diversity uh, as we sample populations further and further away from Africa. And that's an indication of sort of a serial founder effect as human populations left Africa. And all of this is, all of the uh, data I've shown you is consistent with uh, uh, a recent African origin of anatin populations. Now one interesting question I, I can't help but at least mention uh, is uh, what happened as humans went out of Africa and they encountered uh, other groups? Uh, well, they acted like typical humans, they exchanged DNA. Um, a consequence of that uh, is that uh, for uh, non-Africans today, uh, we see about one to four percent contribution in their DNA of their Neanderthal ancestors. 
So we can, uh, another thing we can do with the high density data is to look not at populations, which are always somewhat artificial in, in one way or another, but we can look at individuals. So on this two-dimensional display of genetic relationships, it's a principal components analysis, uh, each dot is an individual. And what's rather remarkable about this is that you can see that uh, this sort of reconstructs a map of Eurasia again showing the correlation between genetic similarity and geographic location. But another thing that it shows is that uh, there is overlap among populations uh, in terms of their membership. So uh, populations, while uh, they, they uh, do tell us something about people, uh, they are not by any means perfect categories. So the microarray-based SNPs uh, as we see, do portray population relationships pretty accurately, uh, but they are biased. They were typically selected for high frequency and diversity in Europeans, uh, whereas complete DNA sequences uh, are essentially unbiased. Uh, and of course, they include a lot of information about not just common, but also rare variants. Uh, this plot that Andy Clark generated now a few years ago from some of the early sequence data uh, shows the effect of that bias on uh, allele counts. Uh, so this is the uh, proportion of SNPs at each allele count. And what you can see is that for uh, the SNP-based HapMap results, uh, there's a real deficiency relative to sequence data in the low-frequency alleles. Uh, it's also interesting that compared to what's called equilibrium, we see excess rare alleles uh, in the sequence data from Perligen and NIEHS. And what that is is a signature of rapid human population growth fairly recently. And that was mentioned in the Tennyson paper that was uh, handed out to everyone. Um, and the way to think about this is that when rare alleles arise, uh, if uh, you have a, a stationary population or a small population, a lot of the time they're lost due to genetic drift. But if you have a rapidly growing population, they tend to be retained. Um, if you're transmitting an allele to, let's say, 10 offspring, uh, you're more likely to, to do so than if you're transmitting to only two offspring. So let's take a look at uh, some of the sequence data uh, and uh, how, how they uh, are displayed, again, in a network diagram. Uh, so this is some analysis that a graduate student uh, of mine did, Wilfred Wu. Uh, so this is, these are individuals. Uh, they've been completely sequenced uh, by uh, complete genomics, 54 individuals. Uh, so each, each, of, each of these uh, tips uh, is an individual from a specific location. So here are the uh, um, 1,000 genomes Yorubans, uh, the Luya from Kenya, Chinese, Japanese. Uh, these are samples from Mexico. Uh, these are the uh, Utah Ceph samples. Um, uh, Tuscan, Puerto Rican, uh, and Gujarati Indians, so that, again, uh, with the sequence data, as with the SNP data, uh, we can see groupings of individuals. Now, not everyone falls easily into those groups. Uh, most of these samples are African American uh, that fall outside this cluster and sort of in between uh, the two groups, non-African and African, reflecting uh, their population history. Now, another thing that uh, Wilfred did was to compare uh, sequence results uh, in the complete genomics data, uh, and 34 of those individuals were also sequenced uh, as part of the 1,000 Genomes Project. So you can see that um, there are two tips for each of those individuals representing the two different uh, sequencing results, uh, and there are some differences. The individuals do group with themselves, as you can see here, but on average, the between platform difference was about 348,000 variants, uh, reflecting in part uh, differences in depth of coverage as well as differences inherent to the platforms. Uh, so some interesting interplatform heterogeneity. So here's a way in which um, sequencing data really differ uh, from the earlier SNP data, uh, the, th that is the earlier microarray data, and that is that they're much more likely to be, those SNPs are much more likely to be population specific. So here's a plot showing overlap among major uh, populations for essentially mostly common SNPs uh, identified uh, earlier in dbSNP, where you see, as I mentioned before, uh, a lot of overlap uh, among populations, that is most variation is shared. 
Whereas for the rarer SNPs, identified uh, now by sequencing, we see much, much less overlap. Most of these SNPs uh, are, in fact, uh, population-specific rather than being shared. And in part, that reflects the fact that uh, here, the average allele frequency difference is around 15%. Uh, there's there's um, a lot of latitude for uh, variation and sharing. So we can understand this uh, by looking at this graph, and I, I won't uh, take you through this equation, but it's a simple way of estimating the age of a SNP allele based on its frequency and an estimate of uh, effective population size. And so you can see that as the frequency gets larger, we estimate the age of the allele to be greater. And for a, an allele whose frequency is about 5%, the age is estimated to be roughly 150,000 years. So it's been around for a long time um, before the out of Africa event, likely to be shared among many populations. Whereas for an allele that has a frequency of 1%, the age is much smaller, post out of Africa, more likely uh, to be population specific. So this gives us a way of understanding uh, those results. Now, with uh, the rare variants, the many rare variants that we see in sequencing data, we can ask the question, well, each time we sequence a genome, how many new variants do we see? Uh, this is work published a couple years ago from David Goldstein's group, showing that the number declines uh, down to something over 100,000. We've extended that uh, with, whole, with uh, 1,000 genomes data to 200 individuals, and you can see that it declines, continues to decline, but very slowly uh, to around 100,000 novel variants uh, for whole genome data uh, each time uh, a new person is sequenced. Now, we can also compare this between populations, which is kind of interesting. Uh, European versus European is shown here. Um, and we see a lot more novel variants when we're comparing individuals between populations, like European versus African, as opposed to within, uh, telling us that we're going to see a lot more uh, what appear to be novel variants if we're comparing two populations with different history. Uh, less so for populations from the same continent, so these are Tuscans, Great Britain, Finns, and so forth, but still, some difference in the rate of decay, the rate of fall off uh, for within population versus between population comparisons. And what that suggests is that if we use the wrong reference population, an inappropriately matched reference population, we're going to see a lot of uh, potentially false positives. And this is an exercise uh, that we published in our VAST paper uh, last year, outlining a methodology for finding disease-causing loci. What we did was compared 30 individuals uh, who were of European ancestry, they were our disease cases, with mixtures of controls of Europeans and Africans. And what you see is that if the control population is mostly matched, we found very few uh, what would be false positives because there was no actual disease here. We shouldn't see any signals. But once we start getting a larger portion of non-European individuals in our control sample, we get hundreds, even over a thousand false positive results. So in this rather extreme example, it's telling us that if we don't properly match our case and control samples when we're looking for rare variants, we're going to have hundreds and hundreds, if not more, of false positives. Now, the last thing that I wanted to mention just briefly, because the issue of power has come up uh, a number of times here, this is a comparison that Chad Huff has done. This work is about to be published where we are looking for a disease-causing gene in a multi-generational pedigree using VAST. Um, what this shows is that uh, the power using uh, sequence data uh, to get genome-wide significance, so this is the genome-wide significance level, is about the same as a traditional LOD score of three in a family uh, if we're using 450 control genomes. But if we simply increase that, this is a simulation, if we increase that to 4,500 control genomes, we can get genome-wide significance with sequence data, where we uh, incorporate functional data and uh, other things, uh, with a LOD score less than two. In other words, having a large sample of controls, uh, which helps us to identify which alleles are truly rare, uh, substantially increases our power. <laughs> 
So uh, to conclude, I see I'm right at 15 minutes here. Um, what we do see uh, from sequence data now uh, is that there are a lot more population-specific rare alleles. Uh, that certainly implies that uh, we'll need more sequencing in more populations. But I think to help guide that, uh, one of the things we need to do uh, is to conduct experiments, essentially, to determine how closely do we need to match case and control populations uh, to minimize false positives. Uh, what FST level, for example, uh, would be small enough so that we can, we can minimize the number of false positives without sequencing too many different populations. And I think this is uh, work that needs to be done now that we're getting more and more sequence data uh, from more and more populations. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, discussion? Uh, go ahead, Derek. Co thank you, sorry, with large cohorts that we're not going to be a identifying a priori, you know, cases and be able to match to controls. So do you think in the absence of the ability to truly match, and I'm taking you literally, we'll be able to in a post hoc way adjust for differences in substructure using some method as opposed to matching a priori? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure that some of the same kinds of methods that have been used uh, to do genome-wide control uh, in uh, GWAS could, pro could be applied um, as well with sequence data. I haven't thought about that too much, but it, it, it should be possible to do those kinds of adjustments. There's always uh, some loss of power when you do that, but, um, but uh, it sh I, I should think that would be possible. Just just for local structure or adjust for just on average this person, sort of an average either PCs or FST? Oh, by local structure? You around the gene, just, around just that in, particular in that gene. local genomic region. Hmm. I, I would think you'd, you'd still want to do it, do it genome-wide, but I'm, I'm curious as to why, why you're thinking you, you might restrict to just around the gene. Can I, can I, maybe I could just ask the question a different way. In a, if I'm studying a rare adverse drug reaction in Tuscany, mm -hmm. can I use Estonians as my controls? Or do I have to use Tuscans as my controls? Well, I think that's one of, one of the things that uh, we need to establish. I mean, that, that, that's, that's why I said I think we need to do these experiments uh, to uh, figure out uh, what level of differentiation will produce a given level of false positives. And I don't think for sequence data we know that yet. But I, but I think it's pretty clear you don't want to use Estonians as controls. Absolutely. Well, okay. <laughs> a bad, a bad example. Well, but you know, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to stay within the Caucasian sort of super family, but Tuscans and, and, and uh, you know, I don't, I don't no. know, mid-France or but something. The, it's, There'll be lots of uh, rare sequence variants at which Tuscans are different from Estonians. Actually, there'll be reasonable numbers of sequence variants at which they'll be different from people who live in southern Italy. So I think you need to be careful. But the, but the question is really what that local context is. I think that question was just asked of you a second ago, Lynn, and, that, and I would raise that question whether if you were interested in a particular drug reaction, could you look in the Estonians locally at that part of chromosome 4 if you saw that there was shared haplotypes in similar structure there, would that may permit you to do it. So there may be a bit of gradation there, but I think, you know, that's the, the question of the difference between sort of globally uh, doing this and looking more locally, because there may be some regions in which you do have more conservation and less admixture, uh, you know, uh, and there are, there are, there are some groups that are looking at this with respect to like P53 mutations and the like that have been very interesting in being able to capture and see a consistency across what otherwise look like very disparate populations within the European set. So, if you look at cases from one region, Tuscany, and controls from Estonia, or I suspect even southern Italy, and the signal you're looking for is a rare variant that differs between the cases and the controls, you'll never know whether it's uh, because of the fact that they're cases and controls or because they're from different uh, regions. I think we need to be really careful. Yeah, I think we're probably thinking in terms of the haplotypes we can look at with, say, SNP data, uh, where you can sort of trace the origin of that region of a chromosome in an individual, uh, but with rare variants, uh, the, that variant may substantially post-date 
the rest of the, uh, then, of the variation I mean, on the, the haplotype. The follow to that is then we really can't, you know, it makes it all the more difficult to use rare variants in any way to adjust like you would use in eigenvectors and, and the like for sort of genomic control. <laughs> is, that what I'm, is that what I'm hearing? Because, you know, there are people who are advocating and also refuting that particular position, saying, you know, that could you use rare variants to and, and develop eigenvectors. I don't, I'm not sure you can globally, but the question is, you know, there, there are local questions that are different, but globally I think that that's really going to be very problematic. Mm -hmm. So, Judy, go ahead. Yeah, um, just a couple of points. One is um, kind of the, the correction for the local differences. Wouldn't that be more relevant for a recently admixed population as opposed to comparing different clades of European ancestry individuals? That's kind of one point or question. Um, and a, a second point is that um, it, a priori, as you, the point you made earlier of using the same approaches to, as we use in GWAS to correct for population substructure, it seems that common variants, but then using additional principal component axes in just one or two or three or four uh, would probably serve as, as well as anything as we can uh, to try to correct for population substructure. Um, just your comments on that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I, Certainly, you could use the ad additional principal components uh, uh, out to as many dimensions as, as, as uh, sort of makes sense given the structure of the data. Uh, for recently admixed populations, that, that's an interesting question, how you would construct <laughs> appropriate controls, but uh, I, I could imagine constructing control data sets uh, comprising uh, the ancestral groups, say two groups, uh, for that admixed population, and 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 that that could be, I think, determined fairly well, and then you've got uh, rare variants from both of those sources, uh, so that you would have at least an approximately appropriate background. I think Rory had one, and then Stephen. Oh, you, you make a very cogent case for having the the cases and the controls from the same population when you're trying to look at rare variants. Um, but if you have the cases and the controls from the same population, do you need to have um, studies in many different populations in order to find rare variants that are related to disease? Or would just having a few actually allow you? Um, so should we be focusing on a few uh, uh, large studies uh, rather than having lots of, of studies in order to have different populations? Well, I think that the, the sample size issue is going to be important. And so um, I think my own, my inclination would be more toward uh, fewer, larger uh, samples rather than many, many small samples. Mm -hmm. Stephen and then Chris. And I just wanted to ask a, a question of you, Lynn, that sort of has come up, and that's the question of like a mold like analysis. I mean, raising this issue of recent admixture. You know, people have tried to use, I mean, they've successfully in, in selected places done this with microsatellites and to a degree with SNPs. The question is, as we get to these rare variants, is this an opportunity that's going to, in your mind, go away? Or could it become a powerful way? to identify these things if indeed you had sufficient number of cases and controls from two different populations and then that had a difference in incidence uh, of a particular disease. It can, you think there is there is space for that or is that going to go away? Yeah, that, that, that's an interesting question. I, I, um, I mean, there's a, there's a literature going back some time on the power of rare variants uh, to um, essentially trace migration movements and uh, in that I think would include admixture movements or admixture events. Uh, so I think rare variants might be especially powerful in that context. A quick question on, so, so there's rare variants and there's, you know, singletons that in aggregate can lead to disease, we think, we're hypothesizing. And is there evidence for population stratification of a burden of variants in a gene um, and should, would that potentially be a protection if, if, in fact, that is leading to diseases or disease traits um, against this, this phenomenon in different populations? Hmm. It's an interesting question. Certainly, if there's, I have to think about that, but if there's been, um, well, one, one thing that, that could uh, 
have an influence on that pattern would be uh, positive selection with hitchhiking of nearby variants. So you could get clusters of variants that elsewhere would be rare, but uh, could be selected to um, rather high frequency in a specific population just as a result of, of a selective event. So that's one way in which that could occur. <laughs> so you'd have a suite of variants uh, uh, that would be in strong linkage disequilibrium with each other as a result of genetic hitchhiking. Is that Maynard and then Daniel. Uh, I, I think this is going to be an extremely important issue for a variety of reasons. There's been a sort of focus on the ability to extract genotype-phenotype correlations without error, but there are, of course, larger social issues on the table. And uh, I, d I just would like to emphasize the point that I think particularly in the United States, that uh, as, as really a kind of point of attitude and policy that we should embrace our sort of mongrel background and uh, not attempt to finesse this problem uh, by injecting notions of ancestral purity into our sort of basic way of sampling the population and so forth. You know, we're going to be dealing with a highly admixed population it will have some advantages and some disadvantages compared to Iceland or wherever, uh, but it's our population, and I think this is the way we should uh, tackle it. The, the problems are quite difficult, but I think that they will look different uh, when we start having whole genome data on uh, a million people. And uh, I just would like to encourage young theoreticians to tackle them. I mean, in principle, each little sort of segment of the genome. There, of course, are major difficulties to finding the boundaries of this segment, which differ from every genome to every other genome. But nonetheless, in principle, each has its own phylogenetic tree. And I think that the long-term theoretical path here is going to be to, to construct those trees. And that this is the way that the reference genome problem will be ultimately attacked, is that every little segment of my genome, or each of my genomes, will have its own reference genome. And I, I think this is a solvable problem with enough data, and I, I, I think for this variety of reasons that I mentioned that we should, uh, it should stay high on the agenda. Thank you. Well, Maynard, I couldn't, couldn't agree with you more about the importance of uh, disabusing people of any notions of any population having any kind of, quote, pur purity. It, uh, it's one thing that genetics teaches us is that there is no such thing. Okay, one uh, last question, Daniel. I think, uh, so Lim, one of the things we see in looking at uh, our exomes from Finnish individuals is the, the effects of the bottleneck, which have taken a, a number of variants that are very rare in the European population in general and bumped them up to a higher frequency in Finland. I was wondering if you could comment then on the, on the benefits, potential benefits of looking in these bottleneck populations, given that many of these sort of rare, potentially very deleterious variants may be found at a higher frequency in populations like the Finns or the Amish or other, other populations here in the U.S.? Well, I, I think you've, uh, you've stated the advantage very well, Dan, that you know, that increases the, the uh, potential signal. Um, uh, not to mention at least some, although I, I think it's fairly marginal, decrease in general uh, heterogeneity in the population. Um, so, you know, I, I see those as potentially quite advantageous populations in the, in, in, for these kinds of analyses. Thank you.